Hey! Greetings, adventurers, or should I say, fellow tarnished. Come to the lands between in search of hashtag medieval combat reference? Of course you have. There's no shame in it. Unfortunately for you, however, you are maidenless. So perhaps like many of you, I have been playing just absolutely way too much Elden Ring as to be a functioning member of society. I have over 100 hours logged at the moment, and I haven't even discovered the full map or completed the game, so please, no spoilers in the comment section, either for me or anyone else. And if you haven't been playing Elden Ring, then one, what are you doing? And two, you're probably very confused by that intro. But this video is about hashtag medieval combat reference for any game developers looking for it, taking inspiration from the new FromSoft game Elden Ring, though not necessarily just about them. Chad from Shadowversity started this initiative, and I am just very honored and grateful to have been one of those named as someone that he wants to see a video from. So FromSoft absolutely nailed it. They knocked it out of the park. Elden Ring is a fantastic, fantastic game. So this video is as much a teaching tool for us as it is a video about maybe correcting some of the faux pas in their basic European weapons. So you can go ahead and skip to the timestamps down below or in the description if you just want to see the combat movesets, but I highly recommend that you watch the full video because we're going to be talking about how I choreograph things and what makes a good telegraph, which are all very important, not just for video game design, but also for if you are doing stage combat, if you are choreographing, or potentially if you are LARPing as well. So while I have fenced, I have done fencing for a number of years, and while I am learning historical European martial arts, HEMA, my main training comes from the fact that I am an actor. I am a stage combatant. So I have taken workshops with the Society of American Fight Directors. I have been part of professional productions, shows, short films, what have you, with fight choreography in them that I have performed. I have choreographed for a number of those productions. I have been fight captain for a number of those productions, even though it can't always be credited as having choreography input or having choreographed the whole thing necessarily because I am not technically certified to, to choreograph anything. It's a legal issue. But suffice it to say that I understand the difference between actual combat with the goal of incapacitating an opponent as quickly as possible and stage combat where the goal is to tell the story. That is to say that it is not enough for a moveset to be historically accurate. It has to tell a story as well and we'll cover that a little bit later in the video. So I want things to be believable, I want them to be realistic, I want them to make martial sense, but at the same time we're also playing a game where you can do a wield greatswords. Obviously that isn't realistic, but we're going to be doing it anyway because it fits the vision that Miyazaki has for his game. It fits the story, and the goal of this channel is to figure out how fantasy tropes might work or look even if they weren't actually historically done. And my job as a performer is to deliver on the vision of the director. My goal is to have the skills to do that as realistically as possible, but at the end of the day, it is a personal goal that I know how to use a sword correctly. It is my literal job to tell a good story. So I am viewing these movesets as choreography, and I am performing them with the proper telegraphs and the proper tempo that I think would fit into a game like Elden Ring, not how they would actually be performed in a real-life duel. So yes, I know the jumping attacks are not viable. But when the director comes to me and says, I want you to do a jumping attack here, it is not my job to say, no, never can't be done, impossible, and then like feel very high and mighty about myself that I know things, but rather to say, okay, and then figure out a way to do it as believably as possible. And if I really can't figure out how to make a jumping attack work, then my job is to figure out what beat does the jumping attack fill in the story and then fill that beat the same way just using a different attack so maybe i'll do an entire video on what my thoughts on fight choreography are but i could talk about this for hours elden ring combat has a lot more in common with stage combat than it does with actual combat if you will allow me to explain because it will inform how it is that i choreograph these movesets and those words should essentially be synonymous a moveset is choreography. When you are learning stage combat, you have choreography. You know the choreography your opponent is going to do, you know the moves that you're going to do, and if one of you gets hit, it's because you made a terrible mistake. In a game like Elden Ring, your opponent has choreography. They have move sets, and you memorize what they are, and you have your own move sets, and you're responsible for knowing what your moves are and how to activate them and use them properly. And if you get hit, with very rare exception, it was completely avoidable, and it's entirely your fault, and that's the beauty of Souls games. You are being dropped into a room with a boss who knows his half of the choreography already, and he doesn't care if you know your half, and he's going to teach you your half by beating you over and over and over and over again until you learn what it is 
is. And when you finally manage to beat that boss, it's because you completed that choreography for the first time correctly. So when you die, that was a rehearsal. And when you finally kill that boss, that is how that fight was supposed to look because you're supposed to be able to beat the game. That was the final performance. And if you've never thought about Souls games like that before and you were struggling to get good and you were having trouble with a certain boss, try thinking about it that way. Think about it as a pattern recognition game. You're learning choreography and each time that you fail, it is just the practice round. That might help put you in the right mindset in order to uh, have a little bit more fun with the game. This is fundamentally different from a game like Kingdom Come Deliverance, where there is no choreography to learn. You can learn certain uh, responses to certain moves and you can try to anticipate what it is that's going to happen, but there is no sequence to memorize. There are no move sets because everything is essentially completely random. The weapons in a game like Kingdom Come Deliverance also operate differently than the weapons do in a game like Elden Ring. The stances that you choose matter because they actually guard different positions and they allow you to do different moves. You also wouldn't be able to fight against a fully armored knight that had a halberd if you only had a dagger, where in a game like Elden Ring, because there is magic and there's PvP, Every weapon needs to be able to fight effectively against every other weapon in order to maintain balance because you don't want anyone feeling that they played the game wrong just because they invested all their points into a playstyle that they liked and then they you know, are completely ineffective. That might be fun if you're doing a historical game and you want to teach edgelords that they would die on a real medieval battlefield, but that is not the purpose of Elden Ring or Dark Souls. And it's okay for me to make a little bit of fun of the edgelords because I myself am a recovering edgelord. I was using the Moonvale Katana up until like a couple of days ago. So we can all have a little bit of a laugh about that. So hopefully I have proven that Elden Ring combat actually has very little to do with mimicking actual combat. It is in fact choreography. And and now I'm going to prove that it can still look like real combat anyway. And there are a number of universal things that we're going to do to fix this. And then I promise we will finally get to the combos. So the first thing that we need to do is utilize martial offensive or defensive guard stances rather than having these huge wide overswings. And the way that we do that by and large is to always have one edge or point of the weapon or a weapon if you're dual wielding, facing the opponent at the beginning and at the end of each of the moves. Very simple to do that. The only exception to this is the Fool's Guard stance, because not only does it have historical precedent to it, but it also has that very anime dynamic look to it that the Souls style games are known for. And it also indicates when a combo is over so that there is something for your opponents to exploit because that is how gameplay in Souls combat works. So the next thing that we need to fix are these huge windups and overswings that are just really over the top and don't look very realistic or martial at all. And I just illustrated how Elden Ring combat is very much like stage combat. So I didn't say that the problem was telegraphing. Telegraphing is very important. We need to keep that. It's how we can play the game. But over exaggerating a swing is not a telegraph. So what makes a good telegraph? A telegraph needs to tell you more than that an attack is happening. It needs to tell you what kind of attack it is, when it is going to hit you, where it is coming from, and when the attack is over so that you can exploit it. FromSoft has consistently nailed its telegraph, so this is not a message for them. They understand that telegraphing actually has very little to do with weapon placement and everything to do with timing. That's why you can change the combat animations in a game without changing the telegraphs, especially because the FromSoft devs understand this. The most important element of a telegraph is tempo, rhythm. You need to portray a transfer of energy. You need to portray inertia. That's where the weight comes from. So if you notice in the game and in the movesets that I have created today, a number of the attacks always happen very quickly, but it is the wind up and the follow through that always take the time to build that tension and convey the power and weight behind the attack. Good telegraphs also need to have a change in speed because if the wind up and the swing and the follow through all happen at the same speed, that's not a telegraph, that's moving in slow motion. And it's very difficult to tell when an attack in slow motion is actually going to hit you because there's no rhythm. You can't count it out. You just sort of have to wait and hope that you timed it right. So it's very easy to illustrate this point with a simple thrust. We are in our guard position, right? We're in our guard position. And then I'll go diagonal. That way you can see everything. There is a sudden jolt to action, right? There is, we come in very quickly and then we are continuing to build. That sudden movement indicates to the opponent that something is happening now and that we continue to build and then the attack comes through very quickly and that we linger for a second 
That lets the opponent know that something has happened and register that the attack has come so that they can learn from it and learn how to predict it in the future. It's easy to see that that's coming. No cameraman today, so don't worry, I'm not putting anyone in danger. <laughs> So it's much easier to demonstrate how that windup should work with a stab than it is with a slash because the slashes have an arc, right? In a stab, all of the energy is being condensed inwards and then expelled outwards in a straight line towards the opponent. It's like a jab, but a slash has an arc. It's like throwing a ball. And you might be inclined to think that telegraphing throwing the ball means you have to do this big windup and overswing, but that's not true. You can telegraph it by just doing this and we'll explain how that works. So there are two things that we need to do in order to make sure that these are good telegraphs. So the first thing we need to do is make sure that we're using stage combat footwork instead of HEMA footwork. In HEMA, you commit to the strike, you commit your energy and your weight into the strike after you've already made it. So you swing first and then you take a step. That makes it harder to predict because the swing is coming before the rest of your weight is coming. And it also makes it easier to recover from if you swing and realize that you screwed up, you're not over committed yet. In stage combat, it is the opposite because everything that you do needs to be helping your partner know that something is about to happen. So you either step first or you step at the same time as your swing so that all of the motion is cueing the eye of your partner, or in this case, your PVP opponent, <laughs> to let them know that the attack is coming. So in HEMA, it would look like this, whereas in stage combat, it would look like this. It's much easier to read that way. And I'm not coming all the way back here, it is just, easier. So the second thing that we need to do, arguably more important, but both of them need to be done, is that the blade needs to be the last thing that reaches your opponent. That is the opposite from actual fighting. In HEMA, if you watch HEMA, right, it is oftentimes not a swing like this because this is a very big telegraph. It is rather an extension into your opponent because the blade needs to be coming at your opponent first. If you think of your weapon as a lever and your hand is the fulcrum, right, you want to minimize that arc as much as possible. So. You know, if you think about how speed equals distance times time, if I can increase the speed at which my weapon covers the distance between you and me, then you have less time to react to it. That is, that's how good fighting works. But in stage combat, it is the exact opposite. We want in a good telegraph for the blade to be the last thing that reaches our opponent. So not only are we leading with our foot, we're stepping first, but we're also leading with our hands. It doesn't have to be this huge, big thing. It can just be a simple lead forward. We're playing with speed, right? Something is coming, something is happening, and then the strike comes. And you can watch my elbows, you can watch my forearms, you can watch my wrists, you can watch the pommel of the weapon, you can watch my hand. And all of these are creating a chain of movement culminating in finally the blade coming down. And it tells you where the attack is coming from, it tells you at what speed, and it tells you when this blade is going to come into contact with you. If you'll notice this swing, I'm actually swinging with the blade at 90 degrees. And you will see in a lot of these cuts that my blade actually appears to be lagging behind the movement of my arm. This is so that you can tell <laughs> what direction the blade is coming from. So yeah, I know that you wouldn't actually want to do that. You'd want to cut very quickly. It's not a big, huge overswing like that. I mean, it, it could look very dramatic, but we could still be here and I could come in. You can see my elbow, you can see my wrist, you can see the pommel. All of that is coming to you before the blade does. That's a good telegraph. And this is all in addition to uh, making use of sound at the same time, a grunt or a breath or a huh, as you were going to attack rather than after or something, that is also a good telegraph. So if we put that all together, a good telegraph can look something like this. And it's not this big sort of thing, but this is still a telegraph strike. We can do that without being in slow motion. We can do that without these big, huge windups, you know, in the armor, because I have so much structure to my body, it's actually very hard <laughs> to overextend anything because I don't have that much mobility. Everything still looks very grounded because I have good form because my armor is keeping my posture correct. It's an interesting thing to think about. It would be, it might be impossible to fight with bad form if you're wearing armor. I don't know. I don't know. So with these weapon move sets, we have light attacks, we have heavy attacks, we have power stancing, which is where you're dual wielding, you have running attacks, and you have jumping attacks. And yes, there are rolling attacks. We'll still we'll see if I feel up to doing those today. And I'm using LARP weapons for some of these, partly because I have more LARP weapons than real weapons, and partly because it's easier while I'm filming. So the first attack set is to use a single dagger, one-handed, and it is a six-move combo, and it looks like this. 
Ha! 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 So we are starting with one single stab from the top right. We are coming down under, very similar to Shad's combo. We have a stab underhanded from the left. Then there is a Z strike, right? We are coming from top, down to left, down to right again. One, two, three, and then back over to the left for one final stab. So with the proper tempo and telegraphs, it's probably actually gonna look a little silly, but it is going to look like this. Ha! 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 Heavy attack would just be the two stabs. It would just be like this. Running attacks, very simple. Running heavy attack. Jumping attacks are always very weird. I am of the opinion that if you're going to be doing a jumping attack, they should pretty much always be some sort of stab or jab. Doing a slash like this is very counterintuitive because your motion is coming up, but you're trying to slash, but you can't use the power of the ground to like generate any of that momentum. So it just, I don't see that being particularly effective. I suppose you could have like a big downward sort of stab like that. But again, my core is capable of generating more power than gravity is. That's why I'm able to stand up right like this and not be pulled over completely by gravity. So it's it would be much better if you were gonna do a downward stab like that to be standing than to let like gravity help you or something. So it makes much more sense to have it, instead of being a jump like this, have the attack be a leap. A jump is straight up and down. A leap is one foot to the other it travels forward. So it makes much more sense to put all of that energy into it an attack like that. So I think a jumping attack with a single dagger would look like this. That makes a little bit more sense to me. So dual wielding, we're going to adopt a stance that is going to be repeated for the arming swords dual wielded. It could be repeated for the rapiers dual wielded. And that is very simply to have the left foot forward, left hand forward with a mid guard here weapon is uh, blade facing the opponent and then we have the other weapon up here on our right it could be down here as well i mean they could both sort of be forward but i just like this one it's very comfortable for me and then the attack combo looks like this three stabs one from the top right bottom left bottom right then we step for two more stabs that's five from the right and the left then we have a cross cut seven there's a grip change back here so that was two slashes here into a grip change. Two more slashes, that's nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. That is a 14 hit combo. And because daggers generally deal less damage, they have a lot less range. I mean, in terms of games, obviously, if you get stabbed with a sword or stabbed with a dagger in real life, it's gonna hurt the same for the most part. <laughs> but it's okay for me if daggers have much faster, longer combos than do arming swords, great swords, etc. So with a proper speed and tempo, that would look something like this. Running attacks while you're dual wielding looks something like this. You're in the guard stance, you come forward, two quick jabs, opposite arm, opposite leg, just like we're walking. So left leg, right arm, and right leg, left arm. The heavy running attack will look something like this. <sighs> Jumping attacks, now that we have the secondary weapon, we're still going with that sort of leap. The first jab is actually sort of clearing the way, the idea being that we're like prodding the opponent's weapon or their shield, trying to create an opening, and then we're coming in with the primary weapon. The jumping light attack would look something like this. Actually, yeah, that's what the jumping attack would look like because when you're power stancing, you don't get heavy and light attacks. You either get to attack with both weapons or you get to attack with the heavy one. I'm realizing that I'm doing some pretty cool stuff. Right, well, that's just a flourish. Uh, <laughs> I'd have to break that down. Okay, we're gonna move on. To a single arming sword. This could be done with a single long sword, bastard sword, I think as well, if we're weighting them properly. <laughs> on guard stance, 
right foot forward, right arm forward. Here we are, combative. I mean, we could be, we could be back here too. I think this is wrath. We could be back here. We could be fully behind. We could be right here. This one's just easy. So the light attack combo looks like this. I think that's six attacks. Might be a little bit long for an arming sword. So you could easily cut that down to have it just be the figure eight and the two slashes coming here. That would be five. Uh, or it could honestly just be the figure eight and the, and the stab, if that's what you wanted to do. There's a number of things you could do. With the proper tempo and telegraphs, that looks like this. Heavy attack combo is just two attacks. It is simply the first swing into a stab on guard stance. We have the telegraph. Let me know in the comments if you feel like you could read that attack coming. I feel like it's very obvious and I still feel like it looks better. The light running attack. Moving on to the sword and the shield, which is small because it's a LARP shield, I know. Um, there are a couple stances, left foot forward. When you're dual wielding weapons, the offhand hand is forward in my experience. It doesn't have to always be that way, but that's a basic rule of thumb that can be applied to basic weapon stances. So the shield is facing forward, protecting our shoulder. So we can raise up here if we need to, and the sword can be behind, the sword can be back here, the sword can be back here, the sword can be here. There's a number of things we could do. So we can be here, we can be here, we can be here, we can be here. A very simple thing to do with a sword and shield would simply to just have a series of little pokes with one big stab at the end. This is, I'm doing it sort of lazy, but it really needs to be a very active I think an interesting mechanic to introduce would actually be able to power stance shields and swords the same way that you can power stance two weapons. So you're actually able to use the shield offensively, like in real life as well. So in order to keep that from being too overpowered compared to dual wielding two swords, because in Elden Ring and Dark Souls, you can't block while you're dual wielding two swords. I think it's a balancing issue. So if you could power stance and attack with your sword and your shield and also still block, no one would dual wield weapons. It would be very realistic. <laughs> so in order to keep that balanced, we have the shield only deal stamina damage. So it still deals less damage than tool wielding two swords. You still get the passive defense and the goal is actually to block break your opponent. That would encourage a very aggressive style of play, even if you were wielding a shield. And it would also encourage you to fight very aggressively against someone using a shield rather than also turtling up. Because if you did that, you would get guard broken by this moveset. We're starting with the left foot forward, shield forward, the weapon is back, and we are coming up with an advance. Right foot comes forward at the same time that we sweep underneath with the weapon. So that looks like this. Here, it looks like this on this side. We're stepping forward, sweeping up. This side, we are stepping forward, sweeping up. And from here, we're going to come around and cut down and sweep with the shield. So all together so far we have come up, cut down and sweep with the shield. The weapon is still offending the opponent. The idea with this is essentially, we were here, that we are baiting out the shield or the blocking implement of the opponent with this attack, right? This comes down and then we are sweeping that weapon out of the way. We are sweeping the shield out of the way. We're catching it with our shield, hooking it over to the side while we're still defending ourselves here. And then we come back around. This is almost like a parry animation. Might be something we can do with that. We're coming back around. Maybe we're hitting the opponent's jaw. Maybe we're hitting their sword hand out of the way. We can keep it in close rather than being way out here. We just keep it in close and then come in with one final long strike. So that full combo looks like this.
And look at this stance that we end in. It looks very anime, looks strong. I'm a little bit exposed to let the enemy know that the, that the moveset is over so that they can exploit it. But it's not way out here. You know, I'm not overextending myself. I'm just, I'm right here. It looks martial, it looks strong. So a running attack with a shield, I think this should allow you to pretty much just tank anything. You should be able to get that. Be able to get that attack without fear of being punished for it because you have the shield up. That's the light attack. The heavy attack would look like this. We're ending in that same position that the combo ends in. Saves a little bit of animation money. When I swing, it's very quick. And then everything pauses for a second as we sit there. Even my hair sort of like flies float forward for a little bit as if time itself is slowing for a second. Jumping attacks with a shield might be interesting if while you're coming in, you're actually parrying whatever attack is coming out of the way, right? Because everyone knows if you're doing a jumping attack, you can't control when you land, someone's just gonna stab you, but you have a shield, use it. So you're coming in, someone's got a pike, someone's got a sword, they're just like, oh cool, a jumping attack. You back that out of the way, and then you come in very quickly. Remember, it's not a jump like that. That's very awkward. It is a leap, a transfer of energy forward. So that looks like this. So there you have it. Now we're getting to the fun part where we can dual wield some arming swords. So it's a similar stance to the daggers. Mid guard here with the offhand, left foot forward, left arm forward, right arm on top. It could be back here could be back here. These guard positions in a game like Elden Ring aren't really gonna mean anything because it doesn't change what the attack combo is. It's just flavor. So lean into that, have certain weapon styles, have specific guard positions that they favor. Maybe, I mean, it would really depend on the discretion of the artistic director, but maybe there's a style of sword that you think just looks much better like this or like this, or there's a history to the weapon that makes it more sense to have a position back here or back here because that's just story-wise how the character uses it. That would be a really interesting flavor thing to add, still drawing from history. So we're here and the attack pattern is a stab with the left hand forward. Then we advance with a stab from the right hand followed by two quick cuts. We are now here, one arm low behind, still offending the opponent. We then come back around, two more quick cuts. And then from here, there's two things we can do. We can bring both weapons forward and have one final stab coming into the on guard position. From here, we can have one more cut to the other side with a stab on this side, advancing with the right foot. Or from here, we can just have one cut and then we return here. So all put together, I'll do that very slowly. We're here with the two weapons. The combo looks like this, stab, 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 cut, 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 stab. Shorter version of the daggers. From here we have stab, 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 cut, 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 stab, something like that. From here on the other side we have stab, 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 cut, 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 stab. And I know that on my offhand I'm rolling the cut over, so I'm not actually cutting with the flat of the blade. Offhand cuts dual wielded or something I'm working on. So there's another variation with this actually, because I think the running attack with the two weapons should look like this, where you're coming in, you're sweeping up underneath with the left hand, and then similar to the shield, also coming up with the right. So that's the running attack. You're coming in. So you could have that same thing for the combo as well, where you come up and then from here, it's the same. And then the jumping attacks, you're coming in, doing two jabs. It's again, very awkward to do a cut. I suppose on the upwards jump, you could do a cut like that. That might be interesting, but it doesn't make sense for arming swords. Jumping attacks. You know, in the game, jumping attacks with two weapons happen like this, like an X. That actually doesn't make any sense to me because if you have one weapon in front of the other, you're only hitting with one of them. You're not hitting with the one in the back. And also, 
to do that from running, it would be. It takes a lot of core control to both wind up and then close your core while in midair. It's much easier, as I said, to do that leap forward with the two stabs. It feels much more natural. So now we move on to a smaller longsword, bastard sword. This is a bastard sword. I really wish that longswords, great swords in the Elden Ring games functioned how they do in real life. Like the katanas work so great. They're long, they have good reach, and they're also, they're pretty fast. And the great swords are just abysmal. Um, they deal way more damage than everything else, but their attacks are so slow that it almost isn't even worth it to me. That and their combos just like aren't as flashy or cool, you know, as they can be in real life. It just, nothing would make long swords more viable. Nothing would make great swords more viable than having better movesets. So we're gonna change that. There is one long sword moveset that I like in the game, but it actually still feels very awkward. I wish I could remember what it was. So the first thing though that we're going to change with the long swords, great swords, two handed swords, is that in the game, they balance the weapon on their shoulder like this. I don't have a problem with that, especially with the much greater weapons. Like, you know, you can't have a sheath on your back unless you have a back scabbard, unless you have a shabbard. The thing that we're going to change with this though, is that instead of having the edge of the weapon on our shoulder, we just have the flat of the blade on our shoulder. I know it's based off of Berserk, the anime, and he, in Guts, has this big sword like this with the edge right on his shoulder. I get it, it looks very cool. It also doesn't make any sense. <laughs> so we have the flat of the blade here. And from here, this is actually not a bad martial position. I'm still strong. I can, you know, I can advance or retreat. I can do those jumping things. Uh, I can strafe, right? <laughs> but from here, there are actually attacks that we can drop from here. So if we look at the way I'm holding the sword, this is the front edge, the way my knuckles are facing. And this is the back edge where my thumb is. The back edge is facing away from me. And I'm actually rotating my wrist and dropping the back edge down on the opponent here. We'll go through all of the, a couple of the stances. The most basic one drawing from what the game does is here with the long sword on the shoulder, wide stance, right foot is forward, left foot. So we're here. We could also be here. We could be here, right? So the left foot is forward. We could be here. Which is almost the same as having the sword on the shoulder. Uh, or you could have it up here in, in, a, in a high stance like this. That's all for flavor. So we're just gonna keep it here, essentially like they do in the game. So this combo is the light attack combo for the long sword, uh, two-handed and it looks like this. We come down here, we come back up, we drop a strike to the opposite side, then we come up. And then from here, there's still a number of things we can do. We can either stab or we can cut across and then stab, or we can come down and then stab on the opposite side. There's a number of things you could do. The choreographer in me is saying, if the only light attack combo was this, I don't have a problem with that. But if you're gonna be doing, right, a series of moves, it can't stop here. That doesn't feel like it's over, does it? It needs to go somewhere. The energy can't just stop right there. It needs to finish right there. It needs to, it needs to finish with some sort of big thing. That's what the choreographer in me is saying. The proper tempo and telegraphs. With a shorter blade like this, the heavy attack could very simply be the same as it was for the arming sword. One-handed combo with a long sword of this size, I think could very easily be the same as it was for the arming sword. So we were here, we have the two figure eight cuts, stab. You know, this thing is probably just about three pounds. It's not a LARP sword, it's real. I'm not swinging it all over the place into the ground, you know? I'm still able to 
still able to control the weapon. Running attack, do the light attack, the strong attack. Could look like that. With a shorter weapon like this, jumping attack should still be that sort of stab. If you're two-handing it, it makes less sense. I guess you'd have you could come from either one of those sides. It's still very awkward, but there's a solution to this with the bigger weapons. With a bigger two-handed sword, this one's probably pushing five pounds. This is a stage combat sword, it's not sharp. It's got no taper uh, to speak of, really. So this thing is heavy. The two-handed combo could easily be the same. I'm able to use that with the same speed, right? So the one-handed attacks when you're two-handing a weapon. We're here on the shoulder again. The telegraph is almost impossible to avoid given how heavy it is, but it comes down. We can still do that sort of stab like that, actually. But when you're one-handing it, I totally buy the big where it slams into the ground. When you're doing a big swing like this, It takes a lot more energy and effort to stop that swing using my elbow, using my bicep. It's really hard not to let that just smash into the ground. Um, so with a really big sword where just one big slam is really the only thing you can do, like gut sword, I buy that. There are some move sets where I think it makes sense. You're doing a big heavy swing, right? The weapon comes behind your head like this, and then that's when you get your spin attack in Dark Souls. So, where it's bigger, heavier, sort of swing. See, I can do that with a real sword. What if, as we're doing the jumping attack, it's a little bit like a poke first, so it's, a, it's like a running attack and a jumping attack at once. So it looks like this. We're coming in, we poke, and then we have a spinning jumping attack. Very similar to how the scimitars are used, the curved swords. Nothing makes weapons more viable than cool move sets. And this fixes everything entirely. Like doing this, that's difficult, especially without slamming into the ground. But doing this, it flows very nicely. And this is not a particularly light sword. You know, and I'm not a particularly weak person either. And it just flows right through. That is a part where that makes sense. We're coming in. The weapon is offending the opponent all the way up until the moment they get hit, <laughs> essentially. Okay, so finally we have two-handing, two-handing war swords, two-handing long swords. So the stance is not going to be as active because this would be very heavy. If, if, I mean, this one's LARP, this one's real. Um, it would be very heavy to have a stance like this the whole time. Though maybe if your strength was high enough, you could like unlock that or something. But so the first weapon is planted here in the ground. The second weapon is back here on the shoulder. And this is still a pretty active stance in my opinion. Like if someone, you know, really, <laughs> if you see someone dual wielding great swords and your first thought is, I can take them. Either you're a badass or you really need to reassess what your uh, capabilities are. So this is still an active stance in my opinion. Again, there's not really very much historical backing for this. I don't no really know anyone who's done this before, historically. So the first attack is to have a poke. Big sword poke. Big, big sword pokes right here. So we're here. I'll show off the stances. We're here. Feel free to take screenshots or something. So we have a stab, sword comes forward. And then the next thing that happens is this sword comes back up here and we have a big swing with the main hand weapon. That comes around. You will notice that this is the same position that we are often in for ugh, the uh, arming swords, but we're not gonna do that. So once again, we have a poke, we have a big, slash here and then from here we're going to do another stab come back through with the big weapon so we're now here almost back where we started from and then we have the obligatory 
double sword slash, and I know I turned this weapon, I could feel it. And yeah, this ending position here, that's pretty open. But you're dual wielding great swords. So running attacks with dual wielding war swords would look something like this. You'd run in. It would have to be two big stabs like that. And then a jumping attack. Oh boy. So something that I hope some people will appreciate is that when you're using a sword like this that's pushing probably five pounds or so, and you're telegraphing in the context of stage combat or you're telegraphing, I mean, if you're in a LARP, you're not using a real heavy sword to begin with, but telegraphing is actually oftentimes a lot harder to do than fighting normally. Like, because you have to be concerned about the safety of your partner. Like if I am supposed to stop my swing here, and I accidentally overswing and I stop it here, that could potentially be dangerous in a scene. If I were to do a big heavy swing like this, that momentum naturally wants to take me all the way around. And if I was doing a big heavy swing like that in an actual situation where I didn't have to care about the safety of my partner because we were actually fighting or something like that, that swing could happen pretty quickly and it wants to go all the way around. But in a telegraph, right, where we're playing with, uh, where we're playing with momentum, I can't let that take me all the way around because if my opponent is coming in through here, that point is gonna catch them in the face. So I have to stop that momentum right there. Every time this big, huge swing has to stop on a dime and then continue with the same speed that it started with. It's just, it's very difficult. And I'm, I'm actually, touching the foot of the camera right here. So the fact that I haven't hit it yet is either a miracle or a testament to my spatial awareness. So I hope that everyone found that informational and entertaining. If you'd like to see a follow-up, I will see what I can do. If you'd like to see Elden Ring content on the channel, official Elden Ring content, then go ahead and let me know in the comments below. And if you'd like to know how to flourish like I do, then let me know in the comments below. I will make a flourishing tutorial video. But in the meantime, I'd like to wish all of you adventurers and all of my fellow Tarnished Good luck on your adventures.